Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here this afternoon to this symposium on service and leadership. I want to give special thanks to our guests, our distinguished speaker, General Stanley McChrystal, and Al Alan Kaze and M Mackenzie Moritz from the Franklin Project. We're delighted to have you with us. In addition to General McChrystal's talk, we will hear from Provost David Harris, who has a very special announcement to make, as well as two wonderful students, Lydia Collins and Philip Ellison, and the new dean of the Jonathan M. Tisch College of Citizenship and Public Service, Alan Solomon. Following the presentations, there will be an opportunity for questions and conversations, and I encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our Dean Alan Solomon. Alan joined Tufts as a Dean in January, though he has been a member of the Tufts family for decades. He served on the Tufts Board of Trustees and was co-chair of the university's Beyond Boundaries campaign. Just before arriving here as Dean, he served as ambassador to Spain and Andorra. And prior to his ambassadorship, he chaired the bipartisan board of directors of the Corporation for National and Community Service. He's a lifetime political and social activist, in addition to being an entrepreneur and businessman. We're extraordinarily fortunate that he's brought those talents back to Tufts, and he's going to provide superb, superb leadership for Tisch College. So please welcome Alan Solomon. Thank you, President Monaco, for that welcome and that introduction, and especially for your commitment as president of this university to keep Tufts a leader in the field of civic engagement. I do have a long history with Tufts University. I first set foot on the Medford campus in the fall of 1966. I've known Tufts as a student, an alumnus, a parent, a member of the Board of Trustees, the founding chair of Tisch College, a visiting instructor in political science, and even a donor. I like to tell people that I bleed brown and blue, and I'm delighted to return to Tufts as the dean of the Jonathan M. Tisch College of Citizen and public service, this is truly a homecoming for me. My own commitment to service and active citizenship was launched and nurtured at this university. Tisch College offers testimony to the fact that fostering civic engagement is not peripheral to Tufts' mission. It is central. It lies at the heart of what makes this university exceptional. Following my nomination in 2009 by President Obama to be the United States Ambassador to Spain and Andorra, I testified at my confirmation hearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I said to the senators, I come before you at an auspicious moment in our nation's history when the President and the Congress have challenged ordinary citizens to roll up their sleeves to help solve the problems of their communities, our nation, and indeed the world. I come before you as one of those citizens, nothing more but nothing less. The notion that we all have responsibilities beyond ourselves speaks to the essence of Tisch College's mission and vision. That we have skills and knowledge to make a difference is a direct result of our Tufts education. Throughout our lives, each of us should ask, how can I, an ordinary citizen, use my ability to better the lives of others? Tufts University and Tisch College encourage students to ask this question and supports them as they search for answers. Tonight you will hear from two remarkable young people, Lydia Collins, Tufts Class of 2017, and Philip Ellison, Class of 2016. Lydia and Philip are students who believe in the power of service to better the lives of others, and they have shown the courage and commitment to act on their belief. As part as a participant in Global Citizen Year, Lydia lived and worked in Ecuador. She was assigned to a microfinance pro program that empowers women, and what she discovered was a community which transformed her life. A New York City native, Philip served as a City Year Corps member in the South Bronx. Working side by side with a team of his peers, Philip learned the value of cross-sector partnerships. His experience led him on a journey that brought him to Tufts University and to Tisch College, and we are the better for it. 
These are the students that we are educating. They come to pursue knowledge at an outstanding research university and to learn to use that knowledge to build a better world. And now, please welcome Lydia Collins. Good afternoon. I'm Lydia Collins, and I'm a first year here at Tufts. When I decided to attend Tufts in the spring of 2012, I simultaneously made another life-changing decision, to not go to Tufts. Right away, that is. I deferred my mission until the following year and signed up to spend a year in Ecuador with a program called Global Citizen Year. Global Citizen Year is a five-year-old bridge year program that sends students to Ecuador, Brazil, or Senegal for an academic year between high school and college. Technically, it is not a it is a bridge year, not a gap year, because the year abroad is not a gap, but rather a bridge between, in my case, two periods of intense academia. Myself, along with 35 other high school graduates, were placed in remote parts of Ecuador, alone, with a host family and an apprenticeship. That is, we weren't all living together, speaking English, and talking about how much we missed Trader Joe's hot showers and bagels. I was 18 and on my own. I was placed in a small city, Ibarra, in the northern Andes, near the Colombian border. I lived with a single mother and her rambunctious teenagers in a modest house at the, the base of a volcano. I worked in, a, in the local market, and my job placement was with a grassroots microfinance organization run by women of the market for women of the market. They gave out small loans to the members so that they could buy, for example, $10 of avocados and hopefully grow their micro businesses. Their effect on the tight-knit community was so impressive. They implemented money-saving workshops, health sessions, and fostered a hard-earned general feeling of woman empowerment. So where do I come in, this tall, strange gringo from Chicago? This is a question that I constantly ask throughout the year and still ask today. I spoke fine Spanish, but didn't know the slightest about the economics of microloans. This is where the service aspect comes in. How was I to help when I didn't know anything? On the first day, my boss, Denise, gave me a rose and asked me to help them. What did helping entail? I wasn't glamorously giving away money to impoverished cheese vendors and single-handedly changing the life of the market on my own. In fact, I probably did little to achieve this vision in the grand scheme of things. I spent long days sitting on a stool helping friends peel peas and yucca and writing endless numbers of loan calculations that made little sense to me at the beginning. I ran to the hardware store to buy electricity cables and to the tienda to buy tape. Yet after truly being in the community amongst my neighbors, I started to feel a niche open itself to me. I felt that there was a, dem a demand for an after-school center, a place where I could teach English and help with homework, a peaceful space that was, silently, that was slightly removed from the general chaos of the market, where kids could feel calm and focused. So with much community support, I opened an empty storefront approximately half the size of the shower in Houston Hall. Um, to an unexpectedly large youthful following. I underestimated the difficulty of creating lesson plans. I learned the art of spontaneous lesson planning and of conflict resolution when two kids fight over a slobbery lollipop. The year progressed and I made many good friends in the market, in my family, and in the community. I was a teacher, an older sister, and an informal American ambassador. I came away from the experience feeling older than my 18 years, after living in intense, humble, and very foreign conditions. But I also came to Tufts with a huge appreciation for my college education, with raw gratitude for the opportunity to be a student, a realistic worldview, greater patience, and more love for those whom I hold close. Now I have a deeper understanding of the difficulty, the difficulty it is to make the world a better place. Being on the ground outside the textbook forced me to face reality the reality that social change and justice are way more than just volunteering a couple hours here and there. It takes effort, grit, resilience, in my case, a couple of bouts with parasites, to finally take what one learns in a service experience and transform it into change. Hopefully myself and those who had similar experiences to me will be able to learn from the adventure and harness that knowledge to one day make their communities happier places. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
Hey, right. Good afternoon. I'm glad to be here. It's an honor to be here with everyone and be able to talk to the fellow Tufts community and the extended community here today. So for me to talk about the inherent values of a bridge year national service program, specifically one like city year, I must begin with the circumstances that led me to take on this call of acting citizenship. While I'm currently a proud jumbo, that I did not start my academic journey here. I was once a student at Penn State. During high school, my father passed away from a heart attack and that changed our family dynamic and income. Due to medical debt without health insurance, my ability to pursue my education was compromised. After much self-doubt and self-deliberation, I decided to exit prematurely. As a young person without a college degree, and employment options were far and few in between. By sheer luck, I was hired by a temp firm to lift, corporate, to lift furniture in corporate offices. I did that for a few months, but my access to competitive education growing up and my mother's lifelong commitment to education prompted me to change my course and work with students in my community. I got a job at an amazing nonprofit called Harlem Children's Zone, and that will forever begin my, my journey working with students. That experience made me eager to better understand our public education system. I discovered the AmeriCorps Partner Program City Year. I applied and was accepted to serve for that year in my hometown of New York City. As a self-described idealist, motivated by recognizing my troubles as a college student, I was drawn to the mission of City Year. It definitely and sincerely excited me. City Year aims to reduce the national high school dropout crisis by pooling together the talent, the idealism, and the intellect of citizens between the ages of 18 and 24. These young people serve full-time as tutors, role models, and mentors to students to make sure that they're on track or that they get back on track to graduate. As a core member, I, worked in the, I had the privilege of working in the Hunts Point community in the South Bronx, a school within the poorest congressional district in America. You know, I, I worked with a group of 11 individuals from different races, uh, different genders, strikingly distinct people that maybe we never would have been in the same room together. Together we worked on average 50 hours plus per week, sometimes it seemed more than that, but we were always committed to working with our students. Together, we did lit literacy training, uh, took class students outside of the classroom, made sure that they were you know, reaching where they had to be in terms of their reading, at times math. We supported our classroom teachers and making sure that they were, had the capacity to execute their lesson plans, but sometimes overcrowded classrooms in the public education system. You know, we came up with creative ideas that how do we create school culture that gets them to attend, to want to come back, right, to, to want to do their work. Yeah, and building relationships, whether through recess or lunchtime, you know, that was the key stuff that we could see was working. In addition, the community partnership model between City Year is integral to what, what they do. And I had the privilege of, uh, of working with a community center unlike any I've ever seen before uh, called The Point. Yeah, we ran after school tables, homework tables, we partnered with their after school programs and we also did our own civic engagement lesson plans, right? How do we get them to begin thinking about their environment? What can they do? How can they be leading one day uh, in working with their peers, whether it be from a young age on throughout to high school? Now, in, in City Year's model, a big part of it is also the ability to take on leadership, right? This opportunity for you amongst a, a people who decide to serve a year of their life or more, uh, decide that they want to be around other leaders, people who care about uh, what is going on in this country. And that allowed many of us to flourish and develop. In addition, City is such a dynamic organization where we're thinking about community service, revitalization of the community, whether for the students, whether for the community members, and so forth. And to be clear, our work seemed like it never ended. But to us, to us that was the point. The year was a rare opportunity to do meaningful work alongside community-based organizations and families in Hunts Point that had been there forever, that had been doing the good work and putting up the good fight. We were committed to those parents, we were committed to each other, and we were committed to their students. 
We wanted to make sure at their most crucial point, these students were making it to school every day and getting on track to graduate. The hours were long, the rules were restrictive, and to be honest, sometimes we thought we could have got paid a little bit more. <laughs> but simply put, it was never easy, but always, always worth it. When I saw my students' faces light up in the morning when I greeted them, or when I helped them to make sure they got to the next grade level, or when we were meeting with their parents, or creating up a fun games, or talking about some of the issues that they faced, walking to school, trying to find their way, that's what made me come back every day. You know, being around them humbled us on almost every opportunity. It reminded us that we weren't a group of saviors. Right? We were not a group of saviors. But what we were, were a few young people in a room who understood in order for our democracy to work, we have to give it a shot by working together. We had to be in this together, across race, across genders, across sexuality, across income levels, across economic levels, education levels. We had to work together. Years later, other lessons from City Year in the South Bronx continue to reveal itself. Computing a gap year and, or a bridge year in national service allowed me to succeed and both fail. I think we're overwhelmingly worried about success. What are we going to do after Tufts? How are we going to be successful? But I've, I've come to understand through City Year and those opportunities, failure can be the, one of the most important aspects of being successful. It's City Year and a national gap year program allow me to explore urban education, to understand the dynamics of the public education system. So now that I can go move forward from Tufts and use policy and social entrepreneurship to create solutions. With the current education crisis, opportunity gap, and the subsequent chasm being so wide, I learned a very specific, very fundamental lesson, that we need government, the nonprofit, and the private enterprise to step up and coordinate to come together. We need them to make sure that we're giving ac access to opportunity that every human being deserves, but in reality doesn't get a chance to have access to. And that is why I came to Tufts, to access the education, the network, the resources that would help me further combat these issues, to understand the evolving space of social entrepreneurship, venture philanthropy, and venture capital, where they're merging. And it's through Tisch Scholars, my cohort who is here, faculty, the Gordon Institute, Tufts Entrepreneurship Society, the Africana Studies work, and Dr. Levine's philosophy of civics course that's representative of the Strong Foundation here, committed to active citizenship. And during a gap year, I want to really hone in on this, this point. During a gap year, you begin to understand the world around you that's in a very distinct way that the classroom really can't provide you. That is the power of experience. The, the ability that you'll be challenged in ways that you've never thought of before, and that you'll both fail and succeed, but in, in that instance, those lessons can be the most critical, most critical in creating change that seems sometimes impossible. And in conclusion, I would like to leave you with a poignant quote that I hope inspires you to serve a gap year or just throughout life, right, and follow this Tish and uh, Tufts tradition. Like slavery and apartheid, poverty is not natural. It is man-made and it can be overcome, eradicated by actions of human beings. And overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity. It's not a gesture, it's an act of justice. It is the protection of the fundamental human right, the right to dignity, a right to a decent life. While poverty, poverty persists, there is no true freedom. Freedom fighter, Madiba Nelson Mandela, 2005. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Harris. I have the great pleasure of being the provost here at Tufts University. I've been here since July of 2012. You just heard from two of the many amazing undergraduates that are part of our Tufts community. Quite fantastic individuals. And as fantastic as they are, what's so special about this place is just how many other students there are who are just, maybe not quite just as, but I'll say just as fantastic as Philip and Lydia. So Philip and Lydia shared with us the transformational experiences they had before coming to Tufts. Making a positive difference in local and global communities, 
while discovering what's common across people and what makes us different. We learned that their experiences will affect the trajectories of the communities where they worked, as well as their own personal and intellectual development. Like Philip and Lydia, there are about 25 young people who were admitted to Tufts last year, but who do not did not begin their studies with us this fall. Some are exploring the world, some are pursuing athletic opportunities, and many others are engaged in programs like City Year and Global Citizen Year. What we know is that few of the students who deferred their enrollment have financial need, and all believe that taking a gap year will benefit them during their undergraduate career and beyond. Today, I am proud to announce the launch of the Tufts 1 plus 4 program, an initiative that emerged from our recently completed university-wide strategic planning effort, Tufts the next 10 years. Starting with the young people who will apply to Tufts this fall, so the current high school juniors, 1 plus 4 will enable up to 50 students each year to have the kind of transformational experience that only a select number of young people enjoy currently. One plus four will be just what the name implies. One year of full-time, full-year service without Tufts tuition, followed by the traditional four years of undergraduate experience, I'm sorry to say, with the Tufts tuition part. <laughs> we will partner with existing programs that meet our criteria for providing the experience, an experience that's transformational and supportive for the student while making a positive difference in a community. Now some of you may be wondering, and I've heard from some people as I've been talking to folks over the last eight months about this, so why do we need one plus four? I just told you that there are people like Lydia and Philip who do gap year programs, and we don't have a one plus four for them to do it, so why do we need one plus four? Let's think about some of the reasons. Let's take some of the reasons I've heard for why people don't do gap years. One, I just never thought about it. So I'll ask undergraduates, did you gap year? No. Why? I don't know. It never, just never occurred to me. Well, one plus four will make the gap year an opt out for Tufts applicants. We will tell you, here is something you can apply to if you choose to. If you choose not to, you opted out. You don't have to go out of your way to have it brought into your attention. Second thing I hear often. All right, maybe I thought about a gap year, but I don't know how to do that. Where, where are the programs? What's a good program? I don't know. I don't want to waste my year. We're going to take that out of the way also. Because what we've done is we're putting out an RFP for programs, fantastic programs like the programs that Lydia and Philip were involved in, that will have to meet our criteria for a program that is, has, provides the kind of experience that's critical to us to provide to tough students. So we've taken that out of the way. We can tell you what those great programs are, both in the US and abroad, and we can match you up with those programs. A third thing I hear. This one people often don't articulate as much, but it's clearly there. Well, I don't know. What are people going to say about me if I don't go straight to college? Right? I'm supposed to, you know, I went to preschool. I went to kindergarten. I went to elementary school, middle school, high school. Isn't it like the 13th grade? You just go straight on. So if I don't go, does that mean somehow I'm not ready? I failed? My parents wonder, what are their friends going to say that year, right? Why isn't so-and-so in college? What's wrong with them? Well, what we've done here is to take out the stigma, if there is any stigma or any that sort of concern. Because now it's not, ooh, Johnny is off doing whatever, and we're explaining. Or an employer saying, well, what exactly were you doing in Paraguay for a year? No, what we're saying now is, I came to Tufts. And I chose to be part of a select program at Tufts that's in the one plus four program. As part of that program, I was involved in service, either here in the US or abroad. And that critically affected my development and it positively affected communities around the world. We've taken that out of the equation. And last, if you get through all those, the one that's often there is, um, Provost, do you know how much it costs to go to college? I do actually know how much it costs to go to college. But do you really think I have enough money left to now do this other program? I don't even know how I'm going to pay for college in the first place. I hope the financial aid office comes through. The I can't afford it argument. So what we've done here with the generous support of philanthropists is to democratize the bridge year. And that's what we're saying. This is a bridge. This is not a gap where you go in and hopefully you come out. This is a bridge from high school to Tufts. It's the bridge. We're democratizing the bridge year. What we're saying is if you have demonstrated financial need, if you're someone who would be getting financial aid when you come to Tufts, 
then when you go to this program, we will make sure that finances are not the impediment to you participating. That's addressing, I believe, many of the significant questions, concerns, impediments that I've heard from folks and others has if we've gone, as we've gone around and talked about this. So that's one plus four. Well, the next question you might ask is, okay, but why Tufts, right? Why Tufts? It could be anywhere. Why should Tufts do this? And as I said, I've been provost since July of 2012, and I've had a privilege. It didn't always feel like it, but it's a great privilege to lead the strategic planning effort, which meant I spent a year plus going around and talking to people, as many people in Tufts community as I could find, um, committees, focus groups, all sorts of things, and learning about this institution. And I learned a lot. Here's some of the things I learned. Tufts is committed to transformational experiences. One of the things that makes Tufts special is that it's a, it's a student-centered research university. It's not a university where you say, great, faculty come in, we teach, we'll see you on Wednesday, we're done for now. It's a student-centered research university in which we engage students in the classroom, in academic pursuits outside the classroom, in athletics and in other activities to push students beyond their comfort zones, to push them to places they didn't think were possible, and to be there with them to make sure that they can make it through these experiences were often stressful, and to integrate into their personal development, into their intellectual development. I learned that this is an institution that cares deeply about access. The president announced the $25 million financial aid effort in July of 2012. And I'm happy to say we've exceeded that already, short of the two-year goal. Critically important institution, and access is important. I learned about diversity. This is an institution that really cares about diversity. It has a diversity council that's put out a report it had the courage to say we're not perfect, to put out data that shows some of our warts, and commit to making it better. It's in the process now of hiring a chief diversity officer. I've learned that this is a university, the undergraduates who are primarily on the hill, but certainly not restricted to the hill. I learned that this is a university that has incredible levels of students studying abroad. I learned that this is a university that has an incredible international relations program. This university at the graduate professional level through Fletcher, through other parts of the university, is extremely global. I've learned this is a university that's committed to innovative approaches to local and global challenges. And last, and it wasn't the last one I learned, I learned that there's Tisch College at Tufts University. It's a college that's committed to active citizenship. It's a college that's committed to understanding not just how do we go out and make a difference, but how do we understand what leads some people to get involved and not to, others not to get involved. It's a college that's committed to trying to understand what makes some interventions effective and others not. I know that we're one of the top schools for Teach for America, one of the top schools for the Peace Corps. I know that one plus four blends these core Tufts competencies with the push for service that's being championed by the Franklin Project, more on that in a minute, and also a push that resonates with so many high school students who sometimes, because they're required to involve in service, get the bug, but others, who just can't get enough of service and trying to make a difference. As I mentioned, this emerged from a strategic planning effort. There are three core themes of that plan, and I think one plus four fits nicely with all three. Enabling and integrating transformational experiences. You heard from Lydia and Philip. Engaging, uh, in, engaging and celebrating commonalities and differences. You're not only going to be in communities that are different from the ones you grow up in, you're going to be working with people as your other members in your team, but as also the folks that you partner with uh, who are your constituents who are going to be different. And last, creating innovative approaches to local and global challenges. That fit explains why we've had early success with philanthropists, and it also explains part of why we believe we'll find that support to make sure that we can really support our students for one plus four. Not one or four, but one plus four. So announcing this program today is truly a big thrill for me. But it's not the only exciting thing that happens for me at this event. I also get to introduce General Stanley McChrystal, who's our keynote speaker. So if you've been paying attention at all in the last decade to the news, you've probably heard the name General McChrystal. He's a West Point graduate. He rose through the ranks to a general. That's four stars for civilians like me. I had to look this up. I wasn't sure. He's a former commander of US Joint Special Operations. He's a former commander of US forces in Afghanistan and many other impressive accomplishments in the military. He retired in 2010, and he's currently a senior fellow at Yale's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. Now, as impressive as General McChrystal's military career is, and as many lessons as he could teach us about leadership, focus, resiliency, we didn't invite General McChrystal to be part of this special event because of his military career. 
In 2012, General McChrystal launched the Franklin Project, which has attracted support of an impressive array of leaders from both sides of the political aisle, from the arts, from media, from higher ed, from business, and many other parts of society. The goal, and I quote, is to create one million civilian national service opportunities every year for Americans between the ages of 18 and 28 to get outside their comfort zones while serving side by side with people from different backgrounds. Sounds like toughs. I had pleasure of attending a June 2013 summit led by the Franklin Project, and it was there that much of what I've been hearing from the Tufts community merged with this service message and gave rise to what later was further developed into one plus four. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to give you General Stanley McChrystal. David, thanks so much. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. When the boom erupts, it's always a surprise. Even if you've heard it before, even if you've seen it, even as a Marine squad is moving down an alley, is expecting it, it's always a surprise. The first thing that comes is a flash of light, and then a shock wave comes over you. You instinctively, reflectively go to the ground, but it takes away your senses. You can't hear, you can't talk. You close your eyes tightly because very quickly after the shock comes a wave of dust and dirt and particles and rocks that are flung your direction. And for up to 30 or so seconds, pebbles will continue to land that have been launched in the air. Slowly, what seems like a long time, your senses start to come back. You open your eyes and you can see. Your hearing is impaired initially because of the loud blast. But you start to hear the crackle of the radio. And very quickly, the radio is calling for help. It's calling for a medical evacuation and it's calling for additional forces to come secure the area, and you know that this has been a painful event. Very quickly, you start to see if you're hurt, and if you're not, you start to move around to see what you can do, either pull security, look after the injured, set up a landing zone for a helicopter if there's room, or for a vehicle if it drives. In this case, the Marine squad sort of shakes it up and they begin to move and they find that one of their comrades, a fellow Marine, has been hit full force by the improvised explosive device and has lost both legs, one above the knee. Fairly quickly, after immediate buddy aid and the medic does what they can, a medical evacuation comes, in this case by a helicopter, and it lands nearby. And a very professional crew goes off, interacts with the Marines on the ground who are caring for their comrade, Tubes start to be inserted into the wounded Marine. He's moved to the medical evacuation helicopter, and he starts to be flown away to a combat support hospital. Furiously in that aircraft, they'll work to save his life. For the rest of his life, he will work to repair what he is, what he does, as he moves through a medical evacuation process and then finally goes home. IEDs are not uncommon. They're a clever way of war. When we first saw improvised explosive devices, they were old artillery shells from Saddam Hussein's armories, and they were simply wired to a wire which somebody would clack off. Then they became more sophisticated. They started to have pressure plates. They started to be remotely detonated by garage door openers, and then cellular telephones, and then in some cases, optical beams. They were hidden inside the carcasses of dead animals alongside the road. They were hidden in trash heaps. In one case, they were actually built into a concrete wall and placed. No way to detect that by sight or touch. It's also a deadly way of war an amazing number of civilian as well as military 
casualties were caused by improvised explosive devices because they don't care who they blew up. Now, in typical fashion, we went to solve that problem. And as Americans, the first thing we tried to do was find a technical fix. We tried tactical things to make sure we could surveil the roads. But we tried technical fixes. We bolted rude armor on our Humvees and other equipment that provided some protection. Then we started a task force to figure out how to stop the improvised explosive devices. We developed jammers, and so that our vehicles moved with jammers that stopped them being able to communicate with the IED and therefore detonate it. And for a while that would work, and then they would figure out a new technique around that countermeasure. And we found out that no matter how much time and effort we would, we worked for a technical fix to include buying specialized vehicles called MRAPs, mine-resistant, armor-protected vehicles. There was really no way to stop the problem entirely because eventually they made improvised explosive devices so large that they could lift a Humvee 40 or 50 feet in the air, spin it many times, bring it down in debris, and imagine the effect on the human beings involved. So you have a problem for which the comfortable technical solution is no longer available. We knew that we couldn't solve the problem by dealing with the boom, and that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to first mitigate the effects of that blast, and then we were trying to stop it from going off initially near time, and we came to the conclusion that wasn't the way to fix it. The way to fix it, if you think on a timeline with the boom here and everything to the right after the boom, we had to get left of the boom. We had to address the problem before the improvised explosive device was buried in the ground or placed along a roadway. We had to deal with the causes of the problem in a way that was effective. We had to secure the area. We had to change the attitudes of the people. So why, why, why do I mention this? Your chances on experiencing an improvised explosive device here are remote. And many people say, I'll never hear a boom. That is something that will be affected or afflicted on a few. But listen, can't you hear the boom right now? America has a boom that is going on right in our society now. 25% of our high school students don't graduate. There's not going to be much opportunity for a non-high school graduate in an advancing economy. We have a level of political gridlock that is bemoaned by everyone, but fixed right now by none. We have voting rates, participation in citizenship, basic rights of citizenship that are far lower than our history, but also than a tremendous number of countries in the world. They don't equal the concepts upon which the nation was founded. There's a boom going and we have a problem. And if we try to deal with it with the here and now, deal with the effects of the boom, we'll always be reacting. And so the reason I'm so passionate about what David Harris talked about and what others have championed for many years, but now I've joined, is I think we have to get left of the boom. I think we have to get left of the boom in America, and I think the way we get left of the boom is citizenship. I think if we want to make America a better place, what we do is we change the definition of citizenship that for some people has been narrowed. It's been narrowed to, I have rights, I have entitlements. I have limited responsibilities. I should pay my taxes. I should obey laws. And if it's convenient, I will vote. I think citizenship's wider than that. If you go back in our history, Benjamin Franklin established local fire departments, local security. If you think of a farmer could never raise a barn in old days without the help of a community. There was a sense of responsibility, not just to his family or her family, but also to the community, also to the nation. A sense of citizenship means something more 
than rights, citizenship means responsibilities. So if we're going to get left to the boom, it can't be a small incremental effort. There are many good people doing extraordinary things already, but we have big problems and we need a bigger idea. And so I believe very strongly that the big idea is to expand the concept of service in America. We have somehow let the term service or service members apply only to people in uniform, and I think it's much wider. I think it's anyone who serves America in a broad range of areas, conservation, healthcare, education, you name it, serves in a selfless way. I think they change for the experience. During the Second World War, 16 million Americans were in uniform. They were joined by at least as many who worked in factories, who grew gardens, who underwent saving things so that they didn't detract from the national effort. America focused because America and Americans thought they had that need to do it. And as Tom Brokaw wrote very well about the greatest generation, their accomplishments were amazing. But I don't think they were amazing because of what they did in the war. I think they were amazing because they came together, first through a depression and then through an existential threat of world war, and it changed a generation. It changed their thinking about what they should be and what the nation should be and what their responsibility to it was. I think now what we need is the big idea of national service. And the concept behind the Franklin Project is to provide that. It's not mandatory because there's a natural aversion to anything that's mandatory now. If I said, everybody here, I'm going to make you take a $100 bill, half of, them, you, half of you would fight me. <laughs> the other half would say, I got it covered, I'll take them. <laughs> but in reality, what we need to do is change our culture so that civilian service is voluntary but expected of everyone. And it's a realistic opportunity for everyone, not just people with the means for their parents to cover them while they do a gap year or something, but people of every part of America have a realistic opportunity to serve because after you serve, you feel differently about something. After you've contributed to something, you have a different connection. And so I think what we need to do is widen our thinking and decide we are going to get to the left of the boom. Now, some people say there's no demand, but I would counter with the fact that existing programs like Teach for America, AmeriCorps, and City Year are vastly overwhelmed by applications compared to the number of slots that they can provide. And yet, the outcome by those young people is extraordinary. And I would argue that the indirect effect not just of them, but the work that they do and the example that they set has no price tag that can be placed on it. So I think that the idea that it costs too much, it's too hard, it might, be, it might make some people unhappy or uncomfortable is dwarfed by the idea that inside, I think we all know we'd be a better place if we all did more. And we all know that America would be a better place if each of us felt better connected to it. When John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, he stirred something in all of us. I was a child, but you felt immediately, I matter. He told me that what happens here depends on me. And I think it's time, and I'm incredibly honored to be here because I believe what David Harris describes so eloquently in the 1 4 plus 4 program is the exact demonstration of the steps we need to make to make this a reality. Thank you.
you, um, General McChrystal, for that inspiring talk. Uh, we're now, as advertised, we'll be open for questions, conversations for General McChrystal or any of the speakers uh, here this afternoon. If you could please use the two microphones that are down in each aisle. Um, thank you, sir, for being with us today. My name is Catherine Munson, and I'm a 2013 grad um, from the IR program here at Tufts and study with Professor Schultz as well, and an alumna member of the Allies program. I believe you met some of our members earlier at a luncheon. So my question kind of goes back to this idea of, you said there's more TFA applicants than slots, but you also said we need to make this a realistic opportunity, which means that there needs to be some kind of funding behind it. So given that we're seeing all this research coming out of places like the Naval Postgraduate School, the Mr. Y paper saying the biggest threat to national security right now is in fact that we have a crumbling education system, that we're not investing in science and technology. How can we, from a political standpoint, reinvest some of that money that's currently being eaten up by and excuse me, Professor Schultz, I don't want to offend anyone in the room. You may be the only one who will be offended. Eaten up by the JSF program instead of our education program. How can we reallocate money from some of these exorbitantly expensive weapon systems that don't work back to the kids who actually can use them, keeping them in schools and off the streets? Yes, can me? It's a big question, sir. I think you're the only one competent to handle it on yeah, stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm not in the Air Force, so you can cancel the JSF. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> No, here's, yeah. here's the thing. A nation only has a certain amount of money to spend. But you really need to invest your money in things that pay off long term. Now, there's always partisanship, and there's always you can't do nothing in any area. You need to balance. But when I think of national service and I think of education, I think of them as a yin and a yang. They're almost interconnected. Because what education is trying to do is produce people with the right skills, the right knowledge, and the right values. I mean, we try to make our education system also shape people into values that we think will fit into a better society. I think national service is another step in that education. Think about most of the things that you will say, what makes you an educated person now? You'll talk about your classroom time, but then you'll immediately raise something, well, I went off one summer and I did X, and it was scary to me. What you talked about earlier when you went to South America, you're doing something out of your comfort zone, but you come back different. I think that's part of education. And I think that all of us are educated through our lives, but there are certain periods when we give ourselves amazing opportunities to do that. A study was done that said if we implement national service, that the payoff economically is four to one. So for every dollar spent is four. And, and I, you don't have to be a genius or an economist to think that if you give people an opportunity that shapes them, a few less are gonna to go to jail, a few less are gonna have problems, there's gonna be a little bit better uh, work between people. So to me, it's, it's pretty compelling that this is one of those investments that you just, like education, that it's just short-sighted not to make. Can I press you a step farther? So at Tufts, we're lucky to have really generous donors who will, uh, who will fund programs like yeah. the One Plus Four. On a national level, though, sir, who pays for this? Yeah, we did, the, we did the math on this for a million a year, and it'd be $40 billion. And we could do the best selling problem in the, program in the world. And the United States government is not going to pony up $40 billion a year. Not right now. Um, I think what we have to do is a combination of things. First, we need to expand the Serve America Act, at least get it funded to what was promised, and that's not an exorbitant amount. But then, and I think that's sort of the government's demonstration of their in this as well. Then I think there's gotta be a public and private connection. There should be a certain amount of just private philanthropy, people with the means to put it in. Then I think there can be local governments, as they get the benefit of people to serve, can pay part of the cost of having the young people who come to serve, and also companies, either nonprofits. Companies could uh, sponsor a certain number of slots. A very successful company could say, I sponsor X number. And then we've also talked about the ability to do things like Kickstarter, where a young person like you who might have a bunch of friends says, I want to go and do a year. It's going to cost $18,000. And you find people that say, yep, I believe in you, 18,000. So I think it's a combination. In the first part, it's tough, because everybody doesn't want to invest until you're sure it's really going. But over time, particularly when, when institutions like Tufts put their money and their faith into structural things, then pretty soon it'll just be expected. This is 
this is what you do. And I think it'll be much easier to find that money because at the end of the day, $40 billion is not that much money compared to the amount of money spent overall. Great, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for speaking. Uh, I have a question for General McChrystal as well. Uh, when I'm not up here alone, come on now. No, just kidding. Uh, I appreciated all of the discussion on active citizenship, but I study international relations here at Tufts, so I think I would regret not taking the opportunity to ask you a question about a contemporary sure. problem. Uh, so the United States is currently trying to negotiate a security agreement with Afghanistan, yeah. uh, which President Karzai is currently refusing to sign. I was just wondering, based on your own experiences, whether or not you think Afghanistan will sign that agreement, and beyond that, uh, in your mind, what you think Afghanistan is going to look like in 10 years or five years from now? Sure. Um, I think that Afghanistan will sign that agreement. I don't think President Karzai will. I think what you're seeing in Afghanistan right now is President Karzai conducting domestic politics using the United States as a lever. As soon as he signs the security agreement, he is essentially a lame duck. He's done all he's going to do, and he loses the platform, he loses his leverage. So I think what he is doing now is holding on to his strongest piece of leverage that he perceives, I think he's wrong, but that he perceives that he can use. I think that the vast majority of Afghans disagree with him and they find that this is a risk that they would not like to undertake. There's certainly an appetite in Afghanistan to try to push the United States and the West to make a commitment that they believe in and to do things that they'd like because we've done a lot of good, but we've made some mistakes as well. But I think the average Afghan that I communicate with and, and leaders don't want to endanger the relationship. There's been an amazing amount of progress since 2001. We see all the problems, but I saw a lot of the progress as well. And the average Afghan doesn't want to go back to 2001. The young people who've been in school and others have moved beyond that. The females in the population have largely moved beyond that. So that's not, think, that's not something they can contemplate to go back to particularly to a Taliban regime. So I think they're very distressed by the current shenanigans, but I think the April elections come. My expectation is that there will be a certain amount of tumult until then, and then after the elections, there will be a, uh, a conclusion of a security agreement that, that both sides can accept. Thanks so much. Thanks. Hello, my name is Patrick Hammond. I'm also a sophomore here, um, a member of the Allies program as well. And um, I was wondering, this is a question for all, uh, all of you. Um, there's, we talk about many times about being an active citizen, and um, I wonder, when did you at some point feel that you had failed to be that sort of citizen, and any sort of personal experiences that you can uh, talk about in which you did not live up to your expectations, uh, your own expectations of being an active citizenship uh, and what that taught you. <laughs> Any takers? I'll, I'll fail first. I'll, I'll t um, so um, you asked, so I was, um, I had the incredible privilege to be a political appointee in the Obama administration, working on poverty policy. And after about a year and a half, I left that job. And that was very hard. And I felt like I was very much an active citizen there trying to make a difference. Um, but for me, it was about balancing work and family. And it just wasn't working very well. It wasn't working right. It wouldn't if I stayed a lot longer. And so there, it was about understanding those trade-offs and then finding different ways to be an active citizen beyond the opportunity that presented itself. So I guess what I take from that lesson and share with you is that you may see one path to being an active citizen. But when you see other constraints, you have to look for other opportunities. As Tisch College can certainly tell you, there's many opportunities to be an active citizen. I, I just uh, speak briefly, and I also wanted to acknowledge the city, your brothers and sisters who are in the back. Thank you for your service. Um, but in, in the context of city year, as the, the, the founder or founders who are here or the core members, um, right? I mentioned 50 hours a week, you could argue, more, all right, but that commitment uh, takes toll. City Year is not an easy endeavor. I, I don't, you know, if, if you're not committed to active citizenship or trying to make a difference or being an idealist, um, you know, uh, and for, for some people, it's also a good opportunity who might not realize that's what they have. It's a, it's a really big challenge. Um, it's long days, it's also weekends. And so, you know, 
I think just relative to being a student, taking too much on. I remember my year of service, I might have taken a little bit too much on in the beginning, and, and, and it, only gets, it only gets a little bit rougher. Um, and so there are times where you know, it might have been a little bit more later than I would have liked, or um, you know, maybe not reaching the student who you know, one day was great, and the next day it wasn't so great, right? And recognizing that you know, they're also uh, having their experiences um, and as I mentioned earlier, I, as in a country where we're so focused on success, I think it's, it's, it's a really important, I, I worked with a woman uh, politically who started Girls Who Code at Rashma Shajani, first Indian woman to run, run for Congress, and she ran for Congress and lost. She just ran for office because when she believed that she was the right person, and so did I, and she also lost. But she's also started an amazing, amazing organization that's national, coming to Boston. And I had to look at that year and say, though I might have failed at times, how, what did I learn from it, and how could I build off of it, whether for the future or in that moment? And uh, you know, City Year provided those opportunities um, where I struggled. There were other things that came up, and I was able to take leadership on. Uh, and so I think you have to keep in mind that like, failure happens. I dropped out of school, but in the end, there's lessons to be learned from that. The biggest risk to um, thank you. The biggest risk to pursuing a, a, a lifetime of, of, of active citizenship or civic engagement is cynicism. Is failing, experiencing failure, and giving up, and thinking, "Well, I can't do anything about this." Um, you know, I years ago in the 1970s, I was a community organizer in Lowell, Massachusetts, and I worked on issues having to do with with housing and workplace safety and and, and um, helping working people and poor people you know, get ahead. And I can go back to Lowell, Massachusetts today and find some of the same problems that exist. Um, I was part of the effort to get the Serve America Act uh, passed in 2009 with the hope of tripling the size of AmeriCorps and then watched as the Congress refused to fund the increase in the program. One could easily give up and say it's just we're in a hopeless situation. And I think that the message that is worth conveying is the importance of accepting failure as part of the process and realizing that this is, uh, this is a journey. And as, as Philip said earlier, this is really a, a, a process, uh, an ongoing struggle to try to make little improvements, both in yourself as well as in the world around you. And you have to realize that every day you're going to risk slipping back and you have to pick yourself up and propel yourself forward again uh, and, and refuse to accept cynicism as the answer. Thank you and thank you General McChrystal for being here. Uh, hi, I'm Josh Weiner, I'm a senior here. Uh, I just want to ask the whole panel about a term which General used about the notion of the, the Depression and World War II era being the greatest generation. I've never been quite Never been quite so sure how I feel about this term, but do you feel that there's, in fact, less incentive now for doing the right thing than there was 70 some years ago or even previously? And what do you think, short of the threat of an outbreak of another world war, could get that incentive back to the level where it once was? Yeah, I like to start on that one. Um, when Tom Brokaw cap he captured the phrase, others people may have used it before, I think he was paying tribute to some pretty impressive achievements of a generation, the Depression and whatnot, then the Cold War. I mean, a lot of mistakes were made, but a tremendous amount of commitment by an awful lot of people and sacrifice in that uh, sense. I think what has happened in America is we don't sense existential threats quite the same way. Even the Second World War felt like it could change us, but it was only in one spot was it really on US soil in, in Alaska. Since then, everything's sort of been over there. We've had this, we were 50% of the world's gross national product or gross domestic product uh, right after the Second World War. We're not that now, but we had just this behemoth. So we could make extraordinary amount of mistakes and it was sort of okay because we had so much capacity and we did make mistakes and we did some good things. But we are now in a point where it's a little bit like frogs being boiled. We are letting our education system drop further and further vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. We're letting our ability in science and technology to drop further and further. 
We're letting our infrastructure drop further and further comparatively. And whether we like it or not, it's a competitive world. And we seem to have lost the sense that we all have to do something to fix it. There's a sense that they got to fix it. Or Congress ought to pass a law and do something. But Congress is by design us. It's not separate. We are responsible. If something's not right, we have to fix it. And so it's it, that sense that I think that Tom Brokaw was trying to evoke in us and what I think the challenge for us now. Except if I may stand. Please. This generation, your generation, is indicating a desire to serve yeah. and to seek practical solutions to problems like no generation before. And the data bears that out. AmeriCorps is receiving more applications than ever, Teach for America. The reason one plus four is striking a resonant chord is because we're not providing enough opportunities to your generation to do the kinds of things that you want to do. This is, your generation has grown up in a much more diverse world. Diversity means more to you and inclusive, you understand inclusiveness much better than my generation. You also have a much greater international horizon. Uh, you know that this world is getting smaller and you know how to use the modern tools of technology to try to get things done. So I'm actually, I believe that this generation has the capacity and the possibility of being the next greatest generation, and that's a challenge to you. So I, might just, I might just add and use this as an opportunity to say that, you know, again, sociologists, one of the things that's critically important for us to understand is that we have a society because of two highways, the federal highway system and the information superhighway, that is quite segregated socially and is quite segregated by social class. And so part of what's so important in my mind about service is that it's a way of uniting the country. It's a way of getting individuals to understand at a deep level communities and individuals who are very different from the kind of people they know closely from the places they've grown up and the schools that they've attended. Many people have those segregated experiences. Having a more integrated experience, I think, will help us develop more of a civic sense and more of a sense of us rather than us and them. Uh I would just to, to add to that, having in City Year, and I, I happen to take class with the uh, founder of City Year at uh, the Harvard Kennedy School on Mondays, um, and having done this program 20 odd something years after it's begun, and to be able to read about it, is that they were purposely, you know, looking at, at, at that group of individuals, we were all so distinct. And we were, through the processes and through working together, we were able to break down the barriers that I mentioned of race, of gender. That is so important if we're gonna tackle, tackle issues. And I, I've never seen it. I, I've been able to now work with people from all different backgrounds because of that year. And if we're able to really participate in our democracy, we have to be able to be more inclusive in, in reality, right? Not just talk it, but we have to be able to live it. And so I think you know, looking at organizations like that, if more people are gonna participate in national service, you know, we're gonna have more people working together and trying to get things done. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my name is Graham Starr. I'm a junior. I'm also involved in the Allies program here. Um, this question is actually relevant to the last point made by Provost Harris and Philip. Um, we're seeing right now in service that, uh, specifically in the military, the schism in social class is very geared towards people coming from lower class backgrounds. I grew up in a lower class area. Most of the people that I went to school with who graduated high school went into the military afterwards. Um, if we're looking to bridge some sort of service, money is an issue, and that schism in social class is definitely something uh, that is both palpable and re relevant to be addressed. Um, we're seeing that going into Teach for America, going into public service, going into policy is something that you can really only get into coming from a background that allows you the financial resources to do it. And the fact that there is not this funding there means that those who wanna go into a service that is not military seems more difficult and a barrier to break through. If we want to integrate the social classes, get rid of the schism at least somewhat, um, and still bridge some sort of national service uh, issue or, or program, how do we do that effectively if we're still finding the social class perpetuated after this national service program? Yeah, I, I'll start on the, the military part. You're partially right on the military, but there's a perception that the military actually goes down to the 
to the more disadvantaged part of society. It, it actually doesn't. It gets some. The military, only about one third of all young people are eligible to join the military because of their academic, they have to complete high school, they can't have arrests and things like that. So in reality, they are competing for the same people that Tufts is competing largely. There's some physical uh, differences. So your point's exactly right. The military is not even an option for a lot of our society that really needs the most opportunity. So the idea that there's always the last resort, that's really not credible either. So I think when we develop this service uh, program, we've got to have it be as open to everyone as possible because if it doesn't give everyone the opportunity for the experience, then I think we have the great danger that we're going to leave some people behind just by structural fault. I would add, um, well, first of all, one of the reasons why one plus four is structured the way it is is to give those students who admittedly coming to Tufts but wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity for a bridge year um, to have the financial support to do that. So as the provost said, it is democratizing that experience. Um, but if you look at data about young people who serve who are not financially advantaged, and in fact among disadvantaged young people who are unemployed, those who have an opportunity to do community service actually are more likely to find employment. This is data that's been developed by our own researchers at Tisch, by Peter Levine and the folks at Circle. And so there's a real benefit in terms of leveling and giving people opportunity to engaging folks who, who may not come from financially privileged backgrounds in community service. And for that, by the same token, for folks coming from financially privileged backgrounds, being able to work together in situations like that with a diverse group of folks is also something that will reduce the class inequities that you talk about. Another thing is, I think that if you really desire this opportunity, this experience, there are ways to access the money. For example, Global Citizen Year is a costly program, but a third of the kids get a full ride scholarship. So I actually just was working with a girl from my high school who just got a full ride scholarship to go live in Ecuador next year. And so there are opportunities through Global Citizen Year, through other um, gap year programs, and then bridge year. And then um, this one plus four, that the money hopefully in the future is not going to be as much of an issue. A uh, quick uh, follow-up point uh, in this. Um, uh, one of the issues, just to elucidate uh, more into this question, a lot of the big problems that I'm seeing in social class schisms is that a lot of the opportunities aren't known from uh, in, in uh, underprivileged uh, social class uh, structures, circles. Um, so the opportunities of going into different public service initiatives are not available, known, or made public. Uh, so part of addressing this question would be how do you fix that? Just two quick comments. Um, I would agree with, with the undercurrent of some of your comments that this won't solve everything. But I think this is part of the solution. I also think the earlier comments about the cost. Um, as Stan said, we don't have $40 billion ready to sort of fund the whole thing. But I think the fact that we can't fund it all doesn't mean we shouldn't get started. And that's what we're trying to do here at Tufts, is to get started. And I think the best way to figure out how to fund it and how to build that support is to get started and to figure out how it can be part of this broader solution. We're not going to be able to have service solve it all. But one of the other pieces is we know we can't just rely on service and volunteers, and it's got to be those big government programs. It's got to be those other big programs that are funded, and this is part of the way of generating that support. So it's part of the whole process. Uh, and to your, to your point, my, my housemate Jabril here, who's, who's graduating this semester, we also were both honor students back in the South Bronx when I dropped out at community college for a, uh, for a short period of time. And, and so I was like, where is service going, or where are these opportunities going to meet these folks? these underserved populations or these lower income students, right? And I think when we were applying to Tufts and finding the information to go to Tufts and so forth, it was all over the place. We had to do it on our own without any help. Um, and to that point is that the service opportunity has to meet these students. They should be in the schools, not just the Tufts, the Yales, the so forth. They've got to go to the population. The community college is 46% college population. So we've got to be finding where, where, uh, where these students are who could really benefit from service and can be paid from being an AmeriCorps member and a stipend member and uh, look at access through the, those ways. 
Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Hunter. I'm a senior here at Tufts. Um, so my question is more for the undergraduates about how do you feel coming to Tufts having had this service experience before you came um, and surrounded by peers who maybe haven't had those same sort of experiences and broadened out to maybe everyone else. Uh, you know, service connects each other, but ha has it ever made you feel isolated? Like maybe folks around you don't just, they just don't understand what it's like. I'd love to hear, I've been talking for, I'd love to hear Lydia's response. Thank you. So it's important for kids who took bridge years to not be pretentious about it, I think. <laughs> um, sometimes kids can come in and think that they're more mature now and greater worldview, but what I found amongst my peers who've done the bridge years is that in general there's a huge, a much, okay, there's a lot of academic drive. There's an excitement to be in the classroom again, to have the academic structure, and there's appreciation for your education that you saw by being outside the classroom, by being in the real world, you then see that, okay, maybe I actually do need this education to make it past college to then realize these dreams. What I saw in Ecuador was that I was an, an, an observer. I was there to see how things worked and I wasn't there to actually do a lot of change. So then I have that experience and then I come to college and I put context on it. I go to IR class and I learn about the paradigms and all that stuff. <laughs> and then I go back after college into the real world and I can apply both of those things together to then create change or, yeah. Hey, could, you re could you reiterate the question? Again, I big thank for that answer. Could you reiterate the question one more time? Uh, yeah, so just um, how does it feel to be surrounded by peers who haven't had the same sort of ex uh, service experiences as you? And like, like I said, you know, we've been talking about how service can connect us better, but is it maybe isolating at all uh, to, to be in a context where you're the only one who's done something like that? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, and uh, uh, in a serious last gestural note, as a city or core member, we're uniform, whether it be military or national service. The red jackets that are a symbol and the uniforms and the Timberlands. Um, you know, I think walking through New York City or the South Bronx or going back home every day in my uniform, uh, where people didn't know it's maybe city year, uh, that was isolating uh, at, that, at that point in time, but also fundamentally necessary because on the flip side, the students recognized who city year was. Whether they knew your name or not, they knew you were city year. And so, you know, it, there wasn't a somewhat of an isolating experience that you get used to, but you understand the fundamental value. In coming to Tufts, or what I took away from my, my national service or gap year, bridge year uh, experience, was uh, to begin to learn how to manage people. Uh, something I, I needed a lot of work on and still to this day continue uh, to, to work on. Um, you know, manage leaders, manage different, different types of folks. Um, that's, that was vastly, vastly important. Uh, and to be here, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Tisch scholar, second semester here. Uh, and I, have, I think I have some friends here who are Tisch scholars, first year cohort folks. And, they're, I mean, they inspire me all the time. I'm a little bit older than them. I'm a real student uh, to the real, the real program. And, um, but they're, they're friends of mine, and, and they've been gap years. They've been in, in Israel. Two girls in my cohort have been in Israel last year for two different, two different reasons. But now, you know, wanting to delve into privileges and access and how do we go become a community partner, not a savior, representing the Tufts community. Uh, and so, you know, while it can be a little bit different, uh, Tufts has been welcoming, and it's always inspiring to be with the uh, fellow Tisch scholars in those cohorts because there's a lot of people here. You know, we're all smart, we're all nerds, we're all thinking about how do we make a difference, how do we change, how do we utilize this, and so that's a welcoming aspect of being here. Thank you, sir, Second Lieutenant Rainey, ma'am, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I am also a second year at Tufts Medical, and one of the things that kind of stands out to me about this. You can call me an optimist if you will, but when the funding for this sort of uh, project comes, how do you determine where the new service force is gonna go? How do you determine what the priorities will be, whether it be education, health, infrastructure, environment, poverty? Um, how do you see kind of coming together and guiding this? I'm sure all of you have different priorities for where you would like those uh, men and women to, to put their efforts, but I was wondering if you could provide me some insight of how you would like it to look moving forward. Um, the folks at Tisch are working on designing the one plus four program 
so that we find uh, partners where students can go uh, in small groups, by the way, so that they're not isolated, they can support one another, uh, along with other participants in the service activity. But we're looking for service partners that will provide um, opportunities for students to learn, uh, to serve, and to, to develop leadership and civic skills, but also opportunities to make a difference. I don't think we're looking specifically to focus on education or health care. Um, there will be both opportunities to do ser service in domestic sites and international sites. But this is really about building leadership skills, about bu building civic skills, about giving students a, an experience that will, tra that, will, that will inform their academic studies, but also will transform their lives. And I think there are sufficient problems in the world so that we don't have to be that picky and we can find uh, opportunities to touch many of them um, without excluding any. If I may press just a little farther on that, I was actually more referring to the Franklin um, Initiative where if it was going to be you know, involving the federal government, local governments, municipalities, how do you see maybe you know, a certain state and wouldn't agree with the other state as far as what they determine is needed. And I understand that there are plenty of issues to work on, but I guess kind of the collaborative side of things and how you determine where the funding and efforts would go. Sure, I, th I think we're still early in that. So anything I laid out for you undoubtedly will develop in a different direction. But uh, what I would say first is the output of this, the focus is the individuals who do the service. The real goal is to improve citizenship. Now the work that they do must be of value because if it's not, it will transparently be useless to them and they won't get that same value. So the, the plan is to have a certification system to start with existing programs, many of which have already proven great value, city year and whatnot, to reinforce those, but then to have a certification system in which new nonprofit efforts would come in, they would lay out the plan, they would lay out the outputs and whatnot. If they were certified, then they could have uh, certified slots placed against that, and that would, of course, give them priority for resources and whatnot. I don't think that, at least at this point, we'd be ready to take a, a problem solving, whether it's poverty and education and whatnot and a prioritization. There is the intent to take certain geographic areas, certain cities, where we can establish really focused programs so that you start to get critical mass. The more people see service, the more it gets in the culture of an area, I think the more it becomes contagious, it becomes viral and expected. Whereas if it's so separated, it's harder to do that. So the intent is to use some, some cities that are already leaning forward that direction and leverage that as well. Thank you. Um, I've been given the signal that we only can take a, one or two more questions. I see two people standing, so let's uh, get through those and then we'll conclude, thank you. Thank you, good evening. My name is Saraida Velasco. I'm here with a group of uh, fellow students from the Fletcher School. We recently created uh, Fletcher's first public service organization. And what we're, we were interested, General McChrystal, in knowing what we can do to help you with the Franklin Project. Thank you for that question. <laughs> um, is that a plant or? No, but it's, <laughs> I'd like to come down and shake a hand. Um, <laughs> At this point, I think what we need is to create a sense of demand. We've got to show that demand, and what we don't want it to be is a program run by or advocated by 59-year-old men for young people. Best case, we would have a ground swell of groups that form. For example, if students at Tufts or Fletcher, Fletcher were to form a group that basically says, we would like opportunities for national service, were it connected to groups at other schools and in other neighborhoods, and that starts to create an effect of a network that it creates, it advocates and articulates the demand from the people who would be taking part in it. And because you're gonna inherit this country and the world, you know, you're also affecting that. I think that would be the most powerful thing near term and support each other as people do make decisions to go into service. Good evening, my name is Kyle Forsyth. I'm a second year senior core member with City Year serving in Mattapan, Massachusetts. Um, I'm just thinking about kind of when you think of programs such as the Franklin Project coming along and kind of the national push for service. Being a recent college graduate two years ago and choosing between Peace Corps and AmeriCorps, 
where do you value kind of the national service and also serving internationally? Because while we all can agree that it's an amazing leadership opportunity and you grow through each one, when thinking of the Franklin Project, like what is the push for just being national service? Yeah, it is not the intent of the Franklin Project to be solely focused within the United States. The intent is to develop future citizens. And I think part of that work is appropriate in the United States, but part of it should be overseas because if we're gonna make great citizens, citizens gotta see more broadly than their neighborhood or even their, their country. You gotta have that kind of experience because you come back richer for it. So I think that there needs to be a balance. And I think we get some indirect effect because great young people doing things overseas have obvious positive effects in a lot of ways but I think it enriches the generation that we're hoping to, to empower. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think we should give a, a big applause to General McChrystal and all the presenters here.